today in Property We Trust. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And today I'm joined again by author and economist Harry Dent. Hi, Harry. Hi, Martin. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, great to have you back on the channel again. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about today. The first is uh, what's happening down here in Australia with property. But let's start with the US because there was the 14.7% unemployment rate that came out overnight. Yeah, yeah, and we've had 33 million people in the last six weeks get on on the jobless, you know, initial jobless claims, they call them. And of course, all of those don't qualify or don't right away. So there's st that's still probably an understatement. I've been saying, Martin, for, for many months now, I show a chart of the 1980 to 82 recession, which started with a short, sharp crash from, from tightening money and to try to get inflation. And then there was stimulus and there's a rebound and then there was a deep downturn. And then we had 8% unemployment in the first crash and then that tapered off a little bit. And then the second one, we had 11%. So I said, double those numbers at a minimum that, that this first sudden crash here in the US, we're likely to get at least 16% unemployment. I think it'll actually be higher than that since this came in at 14.7. And then in the second deeper crash I see starting later this year, and this really going to hit real estate and, and other factors in Australia, will be 22%, maybe 25% like the Great Depression. So this is this is something we haven't seen in, in 90 years, and, it, and it's serious. Yeah, and um, I noticed that uh, uh, Trump was talking about there'll be a quick rebound and everyone will be back to work and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it doesn't sound to me very convincing, though. No, no, it's not. I mean, you know, he has a very strong base and he gets away with murder, but he, he is losing some steam here because, first of all, he's really handled the... the the COVID-19, the virus thing very poorly. He he was a slower, slower than China, who's he's criticizing to deflect from him. He was very slow to, to, to respond, poo pooed it at first. And now he's like, well, let's get back immediately. Oh, I'm telling you, know, we are seeing in most states outside of New York, which has been the most serious and the hardest hit, they, they're having a second bump in, in both the cases and deaths. Just when people are getting ready to open back up, that's not the right time to do it. You guys in Australia, way better shape with very low deaths, very low cases compared to your population. I was telling you earlier before we got on, you have the, the same amount of deaths we have in Puerto Rico here with 3.2 million people versus your 25 million plus. So you guys uh, have to be one of the best. And we're way better than the states. We have lower death rates and in case rates compared to population in, in the states and way lower than, than uh, New York. But you guys are in, in great shape. You guys are the ones that ought to be opening up. Uh, even Puerto Rico has been very slow to open up here. And, and I think that's just better. I mean, be safe than sorry, because this thing, what is proven about the virus, two things, because we didn't understand it fully at first, but we do know it followed an S-curve. And I was able to project the United States two weeks before the experts and they're the less Trump's experts, which are even worse, <laughs> that this virus was already decelerating. And by early April, it was going to be obvious. And by early May, it's going to be, you know, not an issue that, that it's, people are going to be clear that it is going away rapidly uh, um, and, and stuff. So. So, you know, that that's the thing here. But we do know that that it is far less lethal than we thought, but it is also more infectious. All the, the testings that are people doing of antibodies here are showing up to 50 to 80 times more people have gotten the virus than have reported it. And, and, and that makes the death rate instead of 5% in some countries or 11% in, in uh, uh, Italy. I, I bet the death rate is actually less than a tenth of a percent. So it's less lethal, which is good. It only hits older people who already have health problems and more men than women, because women are healthier in older age than men as a general rule, you know. Um, and, and so the real problem is, hey, you don't want infections to roar up again, because then we'll have to go into lockdown. So I think uh, I'm hoping the U.S. 
continues to be cautious. But I'm telling you, people, even here in Puerto Rico, they're they're biting at the full. I mean, they they want to get out. People have had it, and I don't really care. I, I work out of my office, you know, my condo. And uh, I, I do now more webinars and video stuff, which I like, rather than traveling and speaking. And, and so I don't mind it so much. Uh, but I'm telling you, people are getting sick of it. So this, this is going to be a real issue, whether we start to see problems if we start to lighten up here. And we'll just have to, that's, that's hard to predict. I think there's going to be some problems. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly here, we're, they're starting now to ease very marginally, and people are now saying, well, it was really clear what the rules were, but now effectively the rules are becoming a little less clearer and a little less clearer, and, um, you know, th there's a lot of people who are just stir-crazy, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But, of course, you want to avoid that second bump up, right, like in Singapore oh. and other places, because if you have to go back to sort of phase one again and lock everything down, then essentially the economic consequences consequences are very dramatic. The um, RBA here published their statement on monetary policy yesterday and they ran three scenarios, sort of the scenario which we're on and then they talked about a better scenario and a worse scenario. The worst scenario was effectively a reinfection rate that meant we had to uh, close down for longer and the economic consequences on their modelling which is pretty um, you know, conservative at the best of times, was pretty bad. Um, so it really, really is important not to go too quick in the release side. Otherwise, you just go back to square one again. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, I was on these numbers for days nonstop when I was trying to project when it was going to actually decelerate because that was important. I said the stock market's not going to recover until they see that this virus is clearly retreating. And that was true. All the stimulus did not turn around the stock markets at first. Now, I, I just, re, you know, review it every couple of days. I looked recently, almost every sub significant state in the U.S. other than New York has had a second bump in cases and deaths already. Again, like I said, earlier, that is not a good sign. I, so <laughs> I think we got to be more cautious than you guys. Uh, so I, I hope you guys get to go out. But I'm, I'm hoping we, we, we hold back a little more here in the States. So the question then, Harry, is why is the stock market, you know, what was on point, up 1.9%, the Dow 1.9% today, and it's been relatively strong over the last uh, little while. And then, of course, there was the, well, you know, the China-US trade looks like it could be on, and, and it's almost as though they're looking through the virus. Well, 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 they are, but, I mean, there's not a credible expert other than Donald J. for genius Trump, you know, who, who is predicting anything but a u-shaped recovery at best and a w or l at worst um and 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 again i i've got very direct experience here of something like this because we went through the worst hurricane in 100 years puerto rico we were knocked out electricity largely and everything internet cable I mean, you name it most cell service it was dead zone for three months we had to go to new york and then come back and then it was a slow a, a u-shaped recovery not v-shaped so the market coming back v-shaped tells me one thing martin the same thing i've said for years now markets are on crack and this didn't even phase them and the reason is they it, it is they they attribute this to the virus which is wrong a, a virus a thousand times as bad in 1918 you know the spanish flu which knocked out 50 killed 50 million people estimated they don't know for sure because the statistics weren't so bad the stock market only went down 11% in the U.S. and places maybe a little more in Europe. Because we were in World War I, the markets weren't overvalued and happy times and stuff. And you had to keep the factories going just to supply the soldiers. But even after World War ended, I mean, it, the virus was still hit one more time and we still didn't go down. So, so this market crash is extreme because the market's so overvalued, the economy's so fragile that it can't afford to take this bump. My view, very simply, is that we do not recover from this shock. Yeah, everybody's thinking, oh yeah, yeah, of course, everybody knows we're gonna get 20% unemployment. That's why stock markets didn't go down today with this announcement at 14.7% and, and whatever, 20 million people unemployed. And, and, and they know there's more coming. The markets do think that we're going to come back fairly fast and, and that they think there's another major bailout program. coming. They've already had a second bailout of packages for small business loans. They've had the first check to consumers. They've, they've telegraphed for a long time there's going to be at least a second check. Some people say there's going to be once a month. 
So, so the markets just think, well, this is going to be okay because stimulus, stimulus. But they don't get that when you get a shock like this and when you have so much debt in an economy, in real estate and in business and everything, some businesses and some people um, and some real estate just gets knocked and doesn't come back. People can't make the payment or, or they can't come back even if they get some temporary government assistance. They, you know, they're, they're already struggling. And again, in the hurricane here in Puerto Rico in late 2017, I had 21 restaurants within a, a block and a half. 20% of them went down and never came back. And the seven I loved, only one out of those seven came back. So the best ones went down. So this is, this happens, and people are not getting this. This economy is so overstretched, as you know, from one stimulus after the next, zero interest rates, lower and lower, everything that, that everybody has refinanced three or four times. Everybody's bought a bigger house, they're going to buy one. Everybody's bought a Lexus or a better car, they're going to buy. You know, there's a limit to what do people do because – I know better than anyone, and with slight exception to Australia with stronger demographics, all the developed countries in the world have declining demographic demand after 2007 in the U.S. and after 2010 or 11 in Europe. There, there is nothing to create new demand. It's all stimulus, and stimulus has you know, diminishing returns uh, um, as, as anything like this. When you don't get something for nothing and you get less and less of that something for nothing, until it just collapses. So my view, real simply, Mark, we get this first shock. It's as deep, maybe a little deeper than people think. It does start to recover at first, especially stimulus. And then next thing you know, later this year, particularly after the election, I'm waiting. I'm telling you, I'm betting big. If stocks are still up right around election time, I'm going to short the crap out of them. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they just after the election and all that hype's over and, and Trump and stuff, I know, I know the smart money is going to run if they don't run before. So um, I see the economy is just going to roll back over because of this simple principle. There's going to be a lot of wounded businesses, a lot of wounded individuals, a lot of people that are overstocked with real estate and extra real estate and vacation real estate and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and gosh, a lot of real estate and particularly vacation real estate. But people aren't going to be vacationing for a long time. I, I was supposed to be in Australia right now on a tour, one of two tours this year. I'm not. We're doing webinars instead. And, and, and um, I mean, I think most people aren't going to go on any type of substantial vacation other than some local thing for the next year. So if you got vacation properties and you own them in Australia and people own them here, especially those things. Yeah. So what's going to happen to those? You're going to have no income. Um, and, and, and you're still going to have the debt against them and stuff. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll come on to property in Australia in a second. But I've got one last question with regard to the US, because, of course, the fact is that most of the Fed's stimulus has actually been in the, for the financial system rather than real businesses and real households. Um, you know, if you look at the quantum, they're just throwing more liquidity and more money at the system, aren't they? Yeah, well, well, that's been totally the case. Quantitative easing does not go into the banks. It goes, uh, the banks get reserves out of it. They can use for liquidity, but it does not go into bank deposits, does not go to businesses or consumers that deposit in a bank, and then the bank can lend that money and multiply it. And even if it did go into the banks, the banks aren't lending because businesses overexpanded, consumers overexpanded in the bubble. And most people aren't borrowed and expand. Businesses are borrowing to buy their own stocks and speculate. Consumers are borrowing to speculate uh, and, and, and stuff like that. So, so it's not going to create that sort of money multiplier. It hasn't created inflation, which the gold bugs keep saying will happen. <laughs> the money quantitative easing is central banks printing money out of thin air and buying from financial institutions directly, mostly bonds, but in some cases, asset-backed bonds, junk bonds, and even in Japan, stock ETFs, they're buying from financial institutions money that they're injecting in that came from nowhere. It's not like another investor buying a stock and having to sell something to buy it. No, new money 
coming into the financial system, which raises the value of all financial assets because more money is chasing the same assets because they're not changing. And it's just gone into a financial asset bubble. That's why real estate keeps going up, even in a bad economy. Stocks keep going up. This is the worst recovery in all of history, especially in the United States. All this stimulus, 6%, just fiscal stimulus deficit every year in the U.S., plus you know, half a trillion, trillion dollars a year in quantitative easing and now more. And the economy only grows 2%? What? What it says, Martin, without all this quantitative easing, that you're right, it's just going into financial assets, not to businesses and consumers. It's just basically, it's just preventing what would have been a great recession turning into a depression. That's all it's doing. And, and now, the recent stimulus, and the recent stimulus only in the U.S., this money that's going to small business loans and these checks to consumers, and that's nowhere near all the quantitative easing, not even before, but this recent money is going to consumers and businesses. If they kept doing that and ramping it up, it could cause, that, that, that sort of stimulus is a bit more effective and could cause some inflation. But my view on that is also that, Everybody's scared right now. Everybody doesn't know what's going on and how this is going to work out, no matter what Trump or the experts tell them. I think any money consumers are getting are going to make up for a lack of spending, and nobody's going to be spending more in this environment. Businesses certainly aren't going to invest in this environment, and they didn't even invest when the economy was growing. They used the money to buy back their stocks. So, so anybody that thinks that the economy is going to be back where it was or at new heights next year is crazy delusional <laughs> not yep. even a chance this is going to happen yeah well i mean i look at japan you know they i think the the central bank in japan now owns something like 40 percent of japan last time i looked i think yeah. some re remarkable yeah, number, right? stocks and everything. it's crazy yeah, yeah. and uh, you know they have got uh, you know, long-term issues. They haven't really uh, been able to turn the economy around despite all of this uh, injection for many years. So there is something fundamentally flawed in this whole strategy, in my view. Well, you know, this is another important point, Martin, because a lot of people say, oh, Abe's arrows work. That's not true either, really. The, the Japan had their bubble burst from baby boomers 11 to 15 years before the U.S. and Europe, and their bubble crashed first, and their real estate and stock first, and but but they had their millennial generation come along and start spending in the early 2000s and buying houses and stuff, and they are peaking this year, and and so this whatever minor progress, like a one percent growth rate, has not come as much from the stimulus as the millennial generation in Japan, and it should have been stronger than that, but I'm showing now the demographic trends in Japan are the best they're gonna be, not, not anywhere near what they were in the late 80s, the mid 90s, but the best they're gonna be for now, and they are gonna decline to lower levels than ever in the years and decades ahead. Japan is dead, dead, and, and the only thing that would have helped them if they had deleveraged debt government, but particularly private debt. In most economies, private debt is two to three times the government debt, you know, in 60, 70 percent or more of total debt. That's where the, if you deleverage debt, even though it's painful and causes bankruptcies and companies to fail in banks, it takes debt out of consumers and businesses and makes them healthier and frees up money to spend again. So Japan has never deleveraged. And so when people when when central banks say, whether it be in Australia or Europe or the U.S. or wherever, and say, hey, if we can just get over this virus and now, and then, you know, in the Great Recession of the GFC, these short-term crises will be back to normal again. No, you don't deleverage your debt. You never get back to normal. You never go from what I call the winter deleveraging deflation season into spring mild inflation boom again and japan hasn't in 30 years what more evidence do you need than this japan's real estate also when people in australia or the u.s have told me real estate can't go down as much as you say 40 or 50 percent i'm saying this time in the u.s similar to you that much in the in the more overvalued cities in australia this time it can't happen japan already went down 60 to 70 percent residential in the 90s 80% commercial and never bounced even with the millennials coming along. 
because baby boomers are dying at a faster rate, the larger generation, than the millennials are buying, offsetting that demand net. This, people just don't get the demographics here. There is no coming out of this. The only developed country, the, one of the few developed countries, and they're all small in the world, is Australia, because your Asian immigration, which is still strong, it will take a hit in this downturn, but still strong and should be in the future, gives you a spending wave more like your Asian neighbors than other developed countries. You do have demographics to pull you out of this real estate slump and out of the downturn, but you don't have enough to offset the baby boom dying impact that's gonna hit all developed countries because that was a big wave everywhere. So baby boomers are gonna be dying in increasing numbers into about 2040. I'm gonna be dead by then, Martin, okay, or close, okay? That's how, that's forever for me. Until about 2040, baby boomers are gonna be dying in increasing numbers, pushing against even stronger real estate demand in Australia and pushing against already weak demand in the US and Japan, forget it. Their demand's not strong despite that. Yeah, well, let's come and talk about specifically Australia a bit more then, because uh, what's happened, of course, in the last uh, two or three weeks is that people are starting now to talk about what should we do to stimulate the economy, um, you know, post the, the virus, right? And guess what? All of the property spruikers are now out. So uh, over the last couple of days, we've had people saying abolish stamp duty and turn to a land tax so that you can actually reduce the costs of getting into the property sector or uh, reduce the stamp duty on international transactions to try and get them to come and buy uh, property or yeah. increase the stimulus to first time buyers to get them to come back yeah. in. So, and by the way, the um, rule with regard to meetings, they've allowed now um, open homes to start again. So churches are still shut, but you can actually go and worship at the Shrine of Property. So you know, property is now where yeah. we're at. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, any addition in QE, and it's off the charts here in the US and in Europe, and, and, and you guys are starting to do QE. You guys didn't used to even <laughs> do that. QE pushes down not just short term, you can set short term rates, which they always do and have done. It pushes down long term rates, which makes bonds go up in value, stocks go up in value, and makes real estate cheaper to buy. So, yes, that, that's what everybody's doing. But again, who hasn't bought real estate? And, and you guys finally got your first shock in 2017, which you were warning about. And when that happened, I said, hey, folks, you know, I've been getting all this crap from you in Australia about real estate can't go down. I'm saying that was the appetizer. That was just a taste. That was that is not a buy opportunity, you idiots. Um, and with this with this virus shock and so many people going to be out of work for months, regardless it, even if it's a B-shaped economy, that hits landlords and, and rent, you know, rents don't get paid and mortgage payments don't get paid. I mean, this anybody thinks that, oh, this is a buy opportunity unless you at least wait several, a year, I'd say, to see if we have a more sustainable recovery. And I'm telling you right now, I will bet anybody in this audience, 10 to 1, you do not see a sustainable recovery in most economies, and not even Australia, but certainly not in North America and Europe. You will, and Japan, forget it. In the next, in 2021, you will not see a rebound and going back to normal. Uh, you'll be, you'll be good to just see a decent rebound later this year, which won't even last. I think the year. So, so this is, is, I think, and it's naive to think that people are gonna buy this hype. I think people are more scared now. This is confusing, it should be confusing, just to think, I mean, who knows? I mean, the Great Depression, with these levels of employment, 25% on the first big downturn, which is gonna more be similar to this one, and even 18% on the aftershock in 1937 to 40, I mean, that happened you know, in a, in a, you know, in a rolling fashion, it didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen in five or six weeks where we've just had 33 million people go jobless in six weeks. That who knows what a shock that sudden does. I'm saying it's a knockout punch. It's like, and, and I know what it's like because it's exactly like this hurricane hit us in Puerto Rico. I thought I could, I could stay here and tough it out when my wife was smart enough to leave immediately the next day. 
to a friend she had at Delta that got her first class, you know, out of here. I thought I could stay. Two weeks later, I wagged, I had my tail behind me. It took me two weeks to get out when I realized two days later, there's no way to survive here with everything cut off that in that deep a shock. So, so I think people just don't get it until the shock hits. And, and it's going to take another so many weeks or so for and maybe even a couple months for people to get that. So I think, uh, I think people are going to be more cautious. Of course, some people will run out and take this as a buying opportunity for real estate. And of course, the government wants to. Of course, the real estate associations do. Of course, the real estate brokers are going to talk it up. Don't listen to them. And don't listen to your financial advisor either, by the way. They're going to tell you, just sit through this correction like all corrections. And the stock market will be in new highs in a year or two. And everything's going to be okay. That will not happen. Read my lips. There's not a chance in hell that's going to happen. You will not see higher stock prices in most countries forever, for, for the rest of my lifetime and maybe my kids, okay? And, and I don't think you'll see higher real estate prices than this ever in the United States or for many, many decades. And you might, I don't even think you get back to these levels in Australia that you're at now even though net demand will come back to that level, not for too long, say in the mid 2020s, you're not going to see a bubble follow this bubble. Once bubbles burst, you don't get a bubble again. You know, and, and so I don't think real estate prices will get back to these levels anytime uh, for or at least for many years or decades in Australia. But but at least you'll have a shot at it in Australia. There's no shot in the U.S. and Europe of ever getting to these levels. So this is not the time. To, to hold stocks. This is not the time to hold any real estate that's, that's not more fairly valued. And I try to find that. You can find that in the Midwest and places nobody wants to live in America. But I don't know where you find it in Australia because you got all coastal attractive real estate there. It's not a, it's not a time to hold real estate that you're not going to, you're not happy with, that's not highly overvalued, and you're going to stay in the rest of your life. Sell it and rebuy later. If you got a vacation home, sell it. You can always rebuy a better one, probably at half the price or less later. If you want to stay in your primary home, fine. If you want to downsize, sell your bigger house now. And I would say wait a few years to buy a smaller one to downsize. But, you know, if you don't want to rent no matter what, then sell your bigger house and downsize now. Don't wait until the crash because your bigger house will go down more. So it just, this is just, this should be common sense, but I know it's not because Martin, I always said there's two investments that I can't talk people out of nine out of 10 times. That is gold and personal real estate. Not, not business. Businesses are not emotional about commercial real estate because people are emotionally attached. Oh, it's my sweet home. It's my sweet place, you know. And, and you know, no better way to get rich than real estate. History does not say that. And you know that, Martin. It was the first middle class generation only after World War II that caused a big jump in home buying and affordability. And in the first 30 year mortgages affordable um, and that sort of stuff. And then the baby boom came a one time jump in generational size, neither of those trends will repeat. We're already middle class in the next generation and everywhere except for Australia is small, the same size or smaller and there will not be this endless upward pressure. The real estate boom after World War II is a total anomaly in all of history and we all think since we've seen it for our whole lifetime that there's no better place to put money and especially leveraged by a mortgage in real estate that people are going to find that to be totally untrue in most developed countries in the years ahead in this great crash and even in the decades to follow. You buy a house because you love it or because you can rent it out for positive cash flow. You're not going to buy a house to get rich on anymore. Yeah, it fundamentally changes the rules of the game, doesn't it? And interestingly, the yeah, interestingly, the uh, amount of mortgage stress has gone up dramatically. So we track that. It's now at 38 percent. If it's at 32 percent, another 100,000 households into stress in the last month. Right. And, and that's with all of the banks postponing mortgage interest payments and yeah. re capital repayments. That's right. On, Even with, that's right. Even with all that. And Martin, by the way, just to give you the greatest compliment, 
I've never seen analysis like yours. The, the, particularly your mortgage stress, you have it down to neighborhoods. I mean, every level. But most important, I've never seen this. You have it by lifestyle sectors. That's really important because because hmm. because it shows something I've been saying. It's the high end that's the most stressed in a lot of cases because high end real estate is bubbled way more because because. The high-end people have made a lot more money in this bubble and therefore chase real estate, limited high-end real estate a lot more. And high-end people, as much as they make, they want to show off more than everyday people. I hate to say it. They got bigger egos and they are often in stress more than the everyday people. So, so man, I wish I had uh, – I, I always show your indicators when I come to Australia, but I wish I had somebody as good as you in the United States – not only as a general analyst, but particularly in real estate. Your analysis is just incredible. And, and again, that's why we have you speaking at, the, at this live uh, um, all-day online streaming event we're going to have on May 24th in Australia. Again, this is replacing. I was going to come out and have you as a guest speaker in May, you know, months ago, and we can't do that. So we're going to do – we've had, been having very successful webinars already. We're going to have a full day, 9 to 3 p.m. Uh, on May 24th, Sydney time, um, and a full day webinar with me, you, Robert Kiyosaki, my friend here, the best-selling personal finance author of all time. And the reason I'm having him, it's not just because I like him and I know him, it's because he's the only mainstream expert, and you know this, Martin, who, is, who sees how deep this downturn is going to be. I mean, no mainstream. I mean, I'm good friends with David Bach, and he sold zillions of books. He's a financial buyer. He knows my research and respects it, but he would never predict a downturn in real estate of more than 10 or 20 percent or a stock downturn more than 30, 40 percent. Financial planners, real estate experts just don't do that. So, so you and I and Robert Kiyosaki, I, I don't think you can get a better um, trio of speakers, and we also have Sean Allison from Australia, who is just uh, the best expert I've seen in Australia. We have one in the U.S. that's similar, that knows how to make money with targeted, simple option strategies. It's not that complicated. If somebody tells you exactly what to do and, and limits the risk, they can make money in up and down markets, and of course, faster in down markets. So, so this, I think, this is going to be something that people absolutely, absolutely should not miss. You just go to harrydentlive.com to, to register for this free seminar. At least I think the first thousand people are free. So I, I'm telling you, this, this is, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to, to getting on it with you. And, and I can't think of a better thing to listen to uh, in this time period, especially in Australia. And especially since Australia still has this bigger love affair with real estate. U.S. people got whacked last time and they're not quite as I did. They, they, and particularly younger people who are the up and coming buyers, they do not think real estate is, is the secret path to wealth anymore. They, they, they are in a different mood, but Australians still feel that. So I think it takes me and you to, to, to get enough evidence from both angles to get people real about this. Again, just get unemotional about this. The facts say maybe we're saying real estate is going to go down more than it is. I don't think so. I think it is going to be 40 percent in general, 50 percent in the most overvalued places more. But even if we're a little too pessimistic, there is no way Australia gets through this downturn more global, deeper, more deleveraging around the world without a recession and without a real estate crisis. And of course, you already have massive unemployment. And so you're already in a deep recession or a depression, and the U.S. is already in one. So, so unless you think, like we've been talking, we just miraculously recover from this V-shaped, which I've heard no single credible expert say, outside of Trump and his experts, who if they don't say it, they get fired the next day. This is not going to happen. So, so Man, this is this is a time to get serious. Look at all your financial assets, your stocks, your real estate, and your gold. Gold is going to go down. I think gold. I think there's a high chance gold's already peaking here at 1,800. I've been saying for many months 
that 1800 is the strongest resistance for gold in what I see is a bear market rally back to near the highs and the gold's going to end up below a thousand dollars before this is over and you know what even that's not going to look bad compared to other commodities and stocks around the world and it's going to be more like the downturn we're going to see in real estate and gold's not leveraged by mortgages like most real estate holders yeah. Well, you know, there's always that wonderful contention on the gold bugs, right? Because they, they always uh, wanted to see it up. But uh, I am with you. I think I'm, I'm much uh, more concerned about the downside risk on, on gold. And just before we go, Harry, um, where are you with regard to that fund you were talking about? Oh, uh, right, Martin. You know, um, Dense Sector Fund is a unique mutual fund that I'm going to open only in Australia to start. Uh, Australia is one of my best markets because of the promotion uh, GoCo Group has done, Grego and, and Steve Essa. Uh, we have a better list, more loyal followers. I probably sell four times as many books per capita in Australia, even though it's a, a smaller market. And I found uh, Stone Group, a, a financial uh, advisory firm that has launched mutual funds before that I'm very happy with because most people in the financial services sectors and the way mutual funds are structured and, and financial advisors, what they can do or not, really don't get my research. And, and, and what my research does that is unique when it really comes down to it is I can delineate the economy over time, long periods of time, into four clear seasons where inflation goes in one direction for the whole season, up mildly, up strongly, as in summer, think like in temperatures and heat, or comes down strongly like in fall, or goes into deflation in winter. And in the spring boom of generation will drive the economy up and growth trends up for the entire boom, for 1942 to 68, for the World War II generation, like in the U.S., um, and then they will have a recession, a downtrend from 69 to 82. That's summer. Well, in the fall boom, you get the strongest generations like the baby boom, always infused by more immigrants than usual. And, and that's the strongest boom in demand and growth. And then when that boom peaks and you get and that's where you get bubbles in real estate and stocks and, and things the most, you go into a deeper downturn from a larger generation and the deflation from deleveraging those bubbles causes deflation and oh the deflation changes everything so each season we will only invest in asset classes different types of bonds stocks and stuff commodities that are favored in that season we will diversify of course diversifying gets you better risk return ratio so that's an absolute principle every fund should have but we diversify only in the sectors that all are favored by that. You do not want to be buying any bonds in the summer season when inflation goes up at the highest rate. Inflation devalues all bonds, even good bonds, safe bonds, treasury bonds. Um, and, 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 and so that way we can have an advantage over other funds. Other funds are structured, as everybody knows, oh, large cap growth fund. Oh, small cap growth fund. Oh, value fund. Oh, international stocks. Oh, Asian stocks. Oh, junk bonds. Oh, no, investment grade corporate bonds on out commodities or, or precious metals. OK, this is all good in a way because those people can focus on a certain sectors, but they're very limited. And who would want to sit or who would want to manage a, a, a stock fund, a large cap growth fund? If like from 68 to 82 stocks are going to generally go down or in this case going to go down even more. Um, so, so this is a unique fund. We have the freedom to diversify in all sectors. We are going to be focused in the best sectors. And in addition to that, I have good indicators. Even in a boom, stocks can get extremely overvalued at times, like at the top in 2000, uh, the tech bubble. And, 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 and we can get more defensive when stocks are extremely overvalued, okay? Even in a boom that still favors stocks. More important, my demographic indicators, cradle to grave. I mean, people listened to me before, and we're, we're going to get into this in this seminar. I know what people do 
all their life. You know, when they buy this size house and that size house and when they buy life insurance and, and when they buy the starter car and then the big car and, and I mean everything. So consumer demand in any country or, 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 or region is always changing. And of course, we can upgrade even within a boom to better sectors in that boom. And I'm telling you, one of the things we're going to talk about in the, on this uh, 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 online um, stream uh, uh, cast on, on May 24th is how particularly in developed countries, including Australia, even with your better younger demographics, the strongest sectors are still the aging baby boomers. And there's just clear things like pharmaceuticals and, and cruise ships when they finally come back. And that could take a couple of years in that case, but they will come back. People love cruise ships and it's an, it's an older thing. Um, nursing homes and assisted living facilities, they'll never build enough in any developed country. We can be in those sectors and, and upgrade to them when their time comes and allocate out even if we're still in stock. So, so this fund, there's nothing like it in the world. My plan is to start it in my favorite and best country, Australia, and then down the road, we'll expand it back to the US and, US and stuff. But this is a unique opportunity for people in Australia. So, so what we have, you go to dentsectorfund.com. Um, you can sign up to get on our list. Our list is so you will be notified when we know when this fund is gonna come out. It's targeted for somewhere between June and July. We'd love it to be early June. I'm telling people, get in this fund sooner, not later, because we have to be ahead of this next bigger downturn I'm talking about to really give you the most leverage. If you wait until after that starts, your leverage gets less. You'll still be better to be with us, obviously. So we tell you so you can be prepared and do what you have to do to free up money. But also for the people on this list, we've already got like two over 2,000 people on this list just in the recent months. I'm going to give people every week or so updates when I see changes in the markets and stuff. And, and so, so, so you can be more informed, but also you, get, you continue to get a feeling for how I think differently and how I will make different decisions in this fund when it does come out. So DentSectorFund.com, get on that list. Uh, it, it, is, it is designed absolutely to qualify for superannuation and, and all purposes, but, but certainly a great core fund for your superannuation. Well, Harry, I appreciate your time today. We'll put links to the uh, seminar and to the fund in the comments below. And uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you again on the 24th. It'll be a very interesting day. Yeah, event. yeah, I can't wait, Martin. You, you and I rarely get to speak together outside of, of these interviews. And so I think this is going to be great. Yeah, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, always good to catch up with you and uh, keep safe. And we'll uh, see you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. Bye. -bye.